That's why you can't leave your brain at the door when you come to worship. You have to think about the reasons. You can't leave, you can't go by off your emotions. You got to look and think about all that God has done for you. And then you'll have reason to rejoice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. As Grandma say, when you think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you, my soul, my soul, my soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. about us sometimes, but we, we think praise is about emotion, but no, you, you got to think the praise. <laughs> you got to run your mind back and see how far God has brought you and what he's done for you and what he's done in you and through you. You got to put your mind to work. Think about all those reasons you have to rejoice. He's been good. He's been good. He's shown sure enough been good. Shown sure enough he's been good. Yeah, yeah, we give him hallelujah praise for all he's done and how he's done it. You have your word if you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Would you stand with me uh, in respect and Acknowledgement of the Word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 12. We want to start at verse 1. Um, also, we want to pray for Brother Bob Young. He's having a little medical emergency right now, and so we need to ask the Lord to intervene. Um, not tomorrow, but right now. All right. Matter of fact, let's just pray. Lord, touch his body. Touch his, touch his physical body, Lord, right now. You made Bob Young. You know his name. You have counted every hair on his head. And so, Father, whatever's going on, we ask that you would intervene, that you would stop, that you would heal, give nurses and those who are tending to him now, give him wisdom and direction. Those who will take care of him, give them wisdom and direction. We may look at doctors and nurses, but we're not trusting doctors and nurses. We trust in the you who's, who gave the doctor and nurse wisdom, <laughs> gave them mind, gave them a mind to learn. And so, Father, have your way right now in the life of Brother Young. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. In in 2 Corinthians, it's a familiar passage of Scripture. Um, 
I want to read the first 10 verses. Um, really, to get the full picture, you really need to read uh, chapter 10, 11, and 12. Um, but we want to focus on 12 in these first 10 verses. Let me read for your hearing. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third, to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would be not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Lord, bless your word. Speak to us. Thank you. As you told Paul a couple of thousand years ago, we need to hear again your word to him. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Speak to us now. Your creation is waiting to hear from you. Change us, transform us to be in the image of your son for your glory, for our good. We ask it in the name of the one who died on the cross, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk this morning about perfected power. Perfected power. Perfected power. We, to think about God's power and it being perfected does not seem to go together. For if we are talking about God's power, how can it be perfected? But the text lets us know, if you have a red letter edition of the scripture, this ninth verse is in red. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect. Perfect in weakness. 
Let me tell you what I've said for the last three weeks, and you're going to hear it until you get sick and tired of it or until you do something. You have the life of Jesus in you. Because you have the life of Jesus in you, you have his power. Jesus Christ lives within you, and he did not, when he came to take up residence within you, he did not leave his power somewhere else. When the Holy Spirit comes to take residence, you become the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. He didn't leave his power outside of himself. He brought his whole self. You have the life of Jesus in you. You got his power. Therefore, the power of God is in you. And you know how, for how long? Continually. Eternally. Permanently. And ever, as a result, we have the potential. Potential power. We have stored power, as we've called it, to be the visible demonstration of, the, of his power right now. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, if you have accepted his life into your heart, then you have his power living within you, and you have the potential to visibly demonstrate his power right now in whatever circumstance you happen to be living in. Often we look for that demonstration, though, in the miraculous. We look for miraculous deliverances and supernatural healings. We look, for, we, look, we look for multiplying multiplications. We look for water walking experiences. We pray that might, and you know, we pray because we've seen it in the scripture. We pray that we might experience those same things today. When we're sick, we want God to do what? Heal us. When we broke, we want him to do what? Supply. Multiply. We want him to do some mathematics on our, on our provisions. We pray that we might do that he might do the same thing today to deliver and heal and multiply. And I come to tell you that he will. And he still does. In each of these situations, though, the circumstances is at hand is larger, though, and greater and bigger, than, and it's beyond us. If we're sick, Healing is beyond us. If we're broke, the provision is beyond us. And as a result, God's power is magnified and glorified and exalted when he heals and when he provides. At the same time, no brothers and sisters, I come to tell you when we pray, because when we are sick and we're broke and we have, we've got challenges and we need wisdom, also you, uh, we must understand that God calls his people to do the impossible. There is nothing that we can do for God in obedience to God that we can do in our own power. Whatever he asks us to do, we can't do it. But even if, think about our daily things that we happen to us, the daily occurrences of life. Listen to this. Loving without condition. Finding joy in tough situations. It's experiencing peace when everything around you is going crazy. Showing patience when exasperation is shouting to the highest. Forgiving those who hurt us. Sacrificing for those who don't recognize or appreciate us. Giving when we're tired and exhausted. We need supernatural power to do all of that. And that's a daily thing. To love unconditionally, to forgive when you've been hurt, to go when you don't feel like it, to give when you do not have it. Those are daily things, and that, that's what God asks us to do, commands us to do. That's what God offers us to do, and we can't do it by ourselves. We need God's power to do even the daily thing. And at the same time, God has plans. He got plans, y'all. He has plans, and he's invited us to join him in his plan and his purpose. God has some goals and some intentions. 
I come to tell you that God's sole mission is to make his name glorified here on earth. His sole mission, his sole thing that he wants to do is to make his name exalted. You thought it was to save you. You thought it was to heal your body, fix your situation. No, God's sole pro, his sole mission, his sole goal is to exalt, exalt, lift, glorify his name. Now, the thing is, in order for that to happen, there must be a kingdom takeover. His goal is the overthrow of the world system as we know it. His goal is to bring heaven here on earth. Listen, when every time we pray the model prayer, some of us call the Lord's Prayer, when we say that kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying for a kingdom takeover. Because we do not see him in charge of everything. We don't see every knee bowing and every tongue confessing. And that's the goal. The In Philippians 2, he says, there's going to come a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we don't see that yet. What it's going to require is a takeover. That's what it's going to require. And you know what God does? God uses us to bring about that day, to bring about the kingdom on a day-to-day -day basis. He uses us. Until that time in Revelation, we see the events in Revelation come to pass. Until that time, we have the privilege to be his instruments and his tools, to be his representatives, to demonstrate his kingdom power in the earth. And so you know what we're called to do? We're called to actively work to bring his kingdom into our homes, in our marriages, into the bottom, into, into on our jobs, in our daily interactions. Our job is to bring kingdom principles and kingdom love and kingdom forgiveness in all of our interactions. See, brothers and sisters, because you, Golden Gate, you are a serving church, when you feed the homeless at the bridge, when you love those in recovery, when you witness to the hopeless, when you dine with the tax collector and the prostitute, those are the outcasts of the religious society. When you visit the sick and when you sh the shut in at the hospital and the nursing home, when you care for a sick loved one in your home, when you advocate for justice for the poor and the imprisoned, you are doing kingdom work. You're doing kingdom work. When you mentor, when, you, when you're doing kingdom work. But watch this. Got to be careful. Got to be careful. I'm getting to the, I'm almost at the perfected power. Hang with me. God's power flows through you when you go and do in God's name and for his glory. God's power flows through you only when you go. Go and do in his name and for his glory. See, some of those acts of service that I just named, unbelievers can do that. Some of those acts of service can be done in your own strength and in your own power. You don't have to know Jesus Christ and accept him to go down to the bridge and feed. You, ain't, you don't have to, you don't, it, you don't need Jesus Christ to, to serve your dying mother or brother or spouse. You can do that in, your, in and of your own power, in your own strength. And we see many folk who do not know the Lord, some of them serve more than we do, who say we know the Lord. I didn't write that down there, but it sure made sense right through there. But watch this, the power of God, the, his power is reserved for his purposes. And watch this, and his purpose is the, over, the overthrow of the kingdom of self and the placement of God on the throne of every heart. God wants to place his throne on your heart. And the kingdom of self got to go. There can't be two folks sitting on the throne. Ain't but one king. And you know who that is? If you're not sure, let me tell you, it ain't you. 
Just, just start right there. It's not you. And even, even when we do acts of service, we must go with a kingdom purpose. We must go to display the love of God, and we must, we must give to display the grace of God to, but to those both who do not know Christ and those who already know Christ. We're called to be kingdom representatives, and we cannot do that in our own power. Well, how is God's power then demonstrated? How is it displayed? And there's only seems to be, and I see in Scripture, there's only one way in which God displays his power. is through and in our weakness. He says in verse 9, my power is made perfect in weakness. God's power in us is best on display when it's placed next to weakness. God's power is perfected in my weakness. Perfected simply means this, to be finished, to be fully accomplished, to be complete, to be fulfilled. When in speaking of the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus said this. He said, he said, he says, they are fulfilled. He said the Old Testament scriptures are fulfilled. They are finished. They are completed in him. Same word is used. Jesus said on the cross, when he's dying on the cross, he says, it is finished. He's saying, it's been completed. The work is done. And so when God says to Paul here that you have, you have a thorn, a messenger of Satan, and I know that you have prayed to me to let that thorn be taken away from you, but he says, my grace is sufficient, your, my power is made perfect in your weakness, to be made perfect, to be accomplished, to be completed. In other words, God's power is not demonstrated by your strength. God's power is demonstrated through your weakness. And that's why last week I was saying that, guess what? God does not always remove your weaknesses. He uses your weakness. And I don't know about you. I want him to remove my stuff. Now, I, I ain't holy like, I ain't as holy as the rest of y'all. But see, I want him to remove my weaknesses. I do not want you to see my weaknesses. I do not want you to know my weaknesses. I have, I'm in the business of covering up. Now, ain't y'all, I know, I know. That's, I'm the only one in here. But I, I'm just being transparent. I don't want you to see my stuff. And since the very time, we don't want to see it either. We naturally cover up those, th those areas in which we are weak. We cover up those areas in which we are not smart or not good enough or whatever. And God says, do not do that. Those are the very things that I want to use to glorify my name. It's when you are weak that I give you my strength. Look here. When you got strength, you don't need God. And when you think about your own life, you know, when, you know what? Even if we don't pray but once a year. I tell you what, as soon as trouble comes, folk learn how to pray. You know what? If I handed some of y'all the mic right now and said, come on, let's pray. Would you pray for us? Pastor, I don't know how to pray. I, I'm scared to do that publicly. That's okay, and I understand that. But you know what? When trouble comes, man, y'all figure out, Lord, head bow. Y'all don't, don't know what to say, but soon as trouble come, you can't handle it. Lord, I'm here, head bow. You remember every, every prayer the deacon prayed, your mama prayed, your cousin prayed. You get down on your knees. I'm talking about you can't pray. Oh, yeah, you know how to pray. You know how to talk to him. You know how to tell the Lord what's on your mind, what your needs are. And you watch this. You don't need nobody to pray for you. You figure it out on your own. And you know what? 
that's one of the reasons why God gives you trouble and weakness and puts you in situations you cannot handle and gives you people that you don't want to be with, but you got to be with them. Somebody ought to say, somebody who's working ought to say amen. Some of y'all married, y'all ought to say, oh, you tired? Yeah, that's right. Help me, Lord Jesus. Man. See, this potential of stored power is only activated when we're weak. And I know what I'm speaking is countercultural. It's counter to your feelings. It's counter to how you, we operate in this world. I know it does not make sense in a regular operating, in, where we operate in our marriages, in our homes, with our children, on our jobs. I know it doesn't make sense. But it does not have to make sense to you. God's ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. God operates counterculturally. See, this potential power does not accomplish, watch this, potential power does not accomplish or finish anything. That potential that you have in you ain't doing nothing. It's stored. It's potential. It has not moved to kinetic. It has not moved to action. But God gives power. It simply exists. But God's power in us is activated when we are weak and needy. Our weaknesses are God's opportunities. Dead things represent an opportunity for resurrection. Sickness presents an opportunity for healing. Sadness presents an opportunity for an infusion of joy. Struggles becomes opportunities for endurance. It is in this interaction where our weakness and our power our weakness and God's power kiss and meet. It's where his power is on display. Actually does something. See, God's power is never passive. It's active. You remember what we said last week, 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk but in power. There ain't a bunch of talk. When God's power is put on display, he's exalted. and People are helped. And the lost are discouraged, and the lost and the discouraged and the hopeless find an answer in Jesus Christ. That's only when God's power is on display. Well, let me, what, you say, well, what's the benefit to me then? If his power gets perfected, what, what's the benefit to me? Well, there's a couple of things, and the word says it, and, and then we'll go down from this place. First off, it keeps you from con being conceited. Uh, we don't want to talk about that because none of us are conceited in him but me. Verse 7 says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. God gave him something to harass him. What do you pray when you are feeling harassed? Now, Lord, if you don't fix him, I am. Ain't none of y'all threatened nobody before. That's all right. Just me. Lord, I'll sick the Lord on anybody in a minute. Lord, you better do something to him because I'm about done. I'm sick of this. I'm about sick of her. No, don't none of y'all think like that but me. I understand. I understand. Watch this though. God gives Paul, someone who had been to the third heaven, who had seen paradise. He said, Paul, because I know you might get the big head. And you might go to thinking that because you've seen some stuff that you can't tell about and you, you, can, you, know, you, you got some stuff that ain't nobody ever seen before. To keep your mouth shut, to keep you from getting the big head, I'm going to give you something to harass you. Well, you say, well, why would God let Satan be a messenger to him? 
I'll talk about that in a minute. That my clothes. Watch this. We can get caught up in pride, and pride always goes before the fall. Pride is always the reason for our destruction. We think we can handle it. We can do it on our own. When the supervisors think she can do the job on her own, when the quarterback thinks he can be successful without the offensive lineman, when the husband or wife think they can do without the other, failure is sure to come. As a matter of fact, whenever you get lifted up in pride, God will bring you down a notch or two. Sometimes you have to be weakened for the time.